Gwen Franken Davis was a star of the British theatre during its golden age. Now 92 and still not officially retired, she has worked for over 70 years in the theatre. Encouraged by Ellen Terry, Gwen worked her way up through musical comedy to become one of the most acclaimed actresses of her time, working with Bernard Shaw, Thomas Hardy and many other great names, including Sir John Gielgud. I first met Gwen Franken Davis in 1923 when she was acting and singing very beautifully as Etain, the Lost Princess, in Rutland Barton's opera, The Immortal Hour. And I was particularly interested, of course, in the production because I had been engaged after many uh, alarming auditions to play the part of Romeo to her Juliet, which was coming on in a few weeks' time. I was only 19 and very raw, and Gwen was a marvelous help to me in overcoming my shyness and self-consciousness, though I didn't give a good performance in spite of it. But she became my dear friend, and her generosity and sweetness and wonderful talent has delighted me ever since. She always had this brilliant skill in costume plays and in comedy as well as tragedy. And I loved working with her and always have done. Now that we're both fairly elderly people, I like particularly to remember her in the last part of Shaw's Back to Methuselah, when an enormous egg in the middle of the stage suddenly cracked open, and out of it stepped Gwen in a little white nighty and bare feet, tottering about like a child that was just trying to learn to walk. My father was a very well-known singer. He became the foremost baritone of his day and um, was uh, particularly good in oratorio. He was the, supposed to have been the greatest Elijah since Santley. And, of course, in later years, um, Elga, he um, sang in the first performances of Elga's Garantius with Jervis Elways. And um, later, Elga wrote the part of the Christ in the Apostles for my father. So my early childhood was more music than theatre. But my godmother was Ellen Terry's companion for many years, and I suppose it was uh, the association of this glamorous and wonderful personality that, of course, Ellen Terry was, that sparked off in me the desire that when I grew up, I was going to be an actress, because she had a magical quality. By the time I was 15, I persuaded my mother to let me leave school. I detested school. I said it was going to be no use to me, because I was going to be an actress. So she let me leave school, but she uh, then sent me to a home life training um, for girls um, where I was taught cookery and housewifery and sewing and uh, a bit of kindergarten work and all that sort of thing. It was very useful in later life. But um, she said, no, uh, we must first find out whether really you have got any talent. And that was when she wrote to Miss Terry to say, could she bring me to see Miss Terry? And would Miss Terry hear me recite? and uh, say what she thought about it. So, on a certain date, Mother and I, with great trepidation, went to see Miss Terry, who was then living in a lovely old house in the King's Road, Chelsea, which afterwards, I think, Peter Eustonoff lived in. And I can remember uh, standing rather trembling on the doorstep, and uh, we were ushered in, and Ellen was absolutely sweet, as always, and she said, well, child, now what do you want me to do? What are you, what are you going to do for me? So, with the absolute arrogance of youth and inexperience, I launched into the potion scene from Romeo and Juliet, you see. And uh, she heard me, and she was very sweet, and she said, yes, 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 she did. She, she thought that I had something. And she gave me a little note about it in the potion scene. She didn't think that Juliet would have cried. And then she gave me a little talk about the things that were necessary for an actress and the three great eyes, which were industry, intelligence and imagination and the greatest of these is imagination she said she also said be very much alone and don't go to a school dear don't go to a school they're not one of those schools no get into the theater and in 1911 she did but only in the wings singing in the chorus of a midsummer night's dream it was produced by sir herbert beerbohm tree at his majesty's theater london but gwen was still determined to get onto the stage and so she got an introduction to George Edwards, 
the legendary manager of the Gaiety Theatre. He was an awfully nice elderly gentleman, as I remember, with a walnut moustache and was extremely kindly. And he said, oh, yes, dear, yes, yes, well, sit down, sing me a scale. So I sang him a scale. He said, yes, that'll do, all right. Um, uh, take this note down to Mr. Birchall, tell him to put you in. So that was that. So down I went to the Gaiety uh, with a note to Mr. Birchall, who looked at me with ill-concealed dismay and disgust, because I wasn't all the type. What was a Gaiety well, girl? Well, they were expected to be young, charming and attractive, and, and to, uh, to fill the stalls with the jeunesse de ray of, uh, of London of the time. And I was a nervous, a rather inhibited, shy little creature, uh, not particularly pretty or anything. And he must have thought that the governor had taken leave of his senses. However, the orders was orders, and I was put in to the, the, the chorus. We were rehearsing, I can't remember, I think it was called The Girl in the Taxi. And anyway, um, I was put in the back row of the chorus, and if possible, I was put off the stage. And, you know, I, I was really thrown over. Now, this hurt me deeply because I felt that within myself, I had, I was convinced that I was going to do great things, there was no doubt about it, you see, and uh, it hurt me. And so um, I put up with this for a considerable length of time because of course I had to earn my living and was very grateful to be earning two pounds a week and being in the gaiety at all but I still thought that I ought to be given a chance and perhaps to uh, you know have a little something that would show me off a bit so I mentioned it to the aforesaid elderly gentleman and that I didn't think I was being fairly treated in the matter and that there was more in me than, than Mr. Birchall thought. And anyway, <laughs> another, another letter was obviously sent to, to George Edwards, and Mr. Birchall was told there was going to be a new number coming on, and it was going to be the first sight of the tango, which was going to sweep London by storm, and there were going to be eight couples dancing it, and the dresses were going to be made by Doucet in Paris, and it was going to be, you know, the thing, and I was to be one of the eight dancers. Mr. Birchall's face when he heard the news. <laughs> uh, but there was nothing he could do about it and so I did. I got my chance. For the next few years, Gwen worked mostly in musical comedy on endlessly depressing tours. She sometimes played the lead, but more often than not, understudied. During the Great War, she worked for a while in the censor's office translating the letters of German prisoners of war and she continued her singing both in concert and at the Glastonbury Festival. This had been founded in 1914 by the composer Rutland Boughton, who had been Gwen's father's accompanist. His dream was to establish Glastonbury as England's Bayreuth. It was there in 1919 that Boughton put on a Celtic folk opera which he had composed, called The Immortal Hour, and asked Gwen to sing the part of the fairy princess, Etain. We gave the performances in the assembly rooms in Glastonbury. The benches were hard wooden benches without even any back, so the audience had the utmost discomfort to put up with. Uh, we had one dressing room for the women on one side and one for the men on the other, and it was quite a large chorus, the, the, the choruses in the Immortal Hour. And I remember saying, couldn't I have just a little tiny place to myself? Because I was playing it and I was locked about by the chorus, and I felt I couldn't, couldn't you know, control my thoughts or, or, or get myself quiet. So they found a little tiny cupboard and in this little tiny cupboard, and it was next door to the local bakery, and the waft of the <laughs> warm bread used to come wafting through the dressing room, and by the light of four candles, which I stuck up, because there wasn't any electricity, and all the lighting was done by a couple of what was known as limes, you know, that went hissing, you see, and that was the only uh, illumination there was, and with Russell playing the piano, and that was the first performances of the immortal R, and yet, the magic, the magic of the immortal R transcended those really practically impossible conditions and it's, it, it, it caught on. <laughs> 